And we are live. Welcome, everyone, to episode number five of Pod Splits, the weekly lightning talk. Today, we have two guests, Michael and Anchor from Bulls Exchange, and they are going to talk about atomic or submarine swaps and how to build a privacy first Bitcoin exchange on the Lightning Network. We are streaming live to YouTube on Jitsi and open source alternatives to Slack. And we're also taking your live questions. If you have any questions during this episode, please just put them in the comments on YouTube. Um, ask them on our MetaMost server on the PodSplits channel. The website is mm.fullmode.org or just use the hashtag PodSplits on Twitter. And we'll be asking Anchor and Michael live on the show. And today's co-host is Dennis. Uh, he's the head trader of Bedwala, a blockchain or Bitcoin bank, as I would call it, uh, based in Berlin, and a long local Bitcoiner who's very knowledgeable in the field of exchanges and also quite a bit knowledgeable in Bitcoin and a bit less, but also knowledgeable on the Lightning Network. So he'll be co-hosting today and ask all the interesting questions that um, you and I want to know. And I'm also going to ask some questions, obviously. Um, so welcome, Michael. Welcome, Anchor. It, Hi, guys. Thank you for coming. And it's your stage. <laughs> thank you. Uh, probably start by sharing the screen. Yes, please. Uh -huh. Hope you guys can see. Yep. Can you guys see us now? Great. Yeah. It's working out nicely. Awesome. Uh, so I guess we'll first start with introducing ourselves. Uh, I'm Ankur. I mainly work on product and business side of Bulls. And uh, we have with us Michael as well, uh, who's the brain behind all the cool stuff uh, that we have been churning out from past couple of years. He's a tech lead. Uh, OK, so let's just start with the backstory. Uh, I think I thought like it's actually pretty interesting for you guys to know. Uh, I was working, I think, a couple of years ago for a crypto exchange during summer of my sophomore year in college, and we were building a wallet project. Uh, Michael was an open source contributor for that project while we were building a sort of like a self-custodial lightning wallet. Uh, we quickly realized that the infrastructure around onboarding and offboarding users from the lightning economy in a self-custodial or a trust-minimized manner was sort of non-existent, right? Like it was very early, uh, even for lighting infrastructure groups. So we decided to pivot to building an exchange that does just that, right? And almost two years later, we are here uh, talking about it on pot splits. Uh, all right. So the first question that probably would strike anyone when uh, they'll talk about Bolt is, Bolt is what it is. Uh, so we are a privacy-first, account-free crypto exchange that is completely open source, 100%, and natively supports Lightning. Uh, and one part which might not be as intuitive is we are also a Lightning service provider for wallets and LApps. We'll talk about it uh, in the preceding slides. But uh, we'll go into details about all those three values about being privacy-first, account-free, and open source also later. But uh, the gist of it is like we built polls with a single purpose of building a UX friendly exchange uh, that could provide users an option to trade their assets without giving up custody of their funds, right? And the ethos of like not your keys, not your coins is sort of ingrained in the philosophy of polls. And it is something that we care deeply about. Uh, so before we talk about why we matter, I thought it'd be apt to talk about the issues that many custodial exchanges currently face. Uh, because majority of trading volumes, you know, in digital asset these days flow through these exchanges, uh, name it Coinbase, uh, Kraken, Binance, you know, so the problems pertaining them affects almost everyone in crypto community. Uh, so we think there are like mainly three problems that uh, the current modern day crypto exchange face. The first of them being lack of, lack of anonymity, you know, and pretty much is self-descriptive, but anonymity is one of the core values uh, that is not upheld by these modern day crypto exchanges, right? Governments can just freeze your assets uh, and you can even become a target for targeted hacks, right? Uh, so if, if you got some sort of beef going with the government and you have some funds in, in a crypto exchange, uh, you just don't have access to it anymore when day you wake up <laughs> and realize that. So 
uh, lack of anonymity is a big, big issue that uh, pertains to these custodial exchanges. The second one is obviously the custodial nature of these exchanges. They hold a closed source order book and uh, they hold user funds on their behalf. And we have seen from the days of you know, Mount Cox how susceptible closed source exchanges are to hacks. So even exchanges like you know, Coinbase, et cetera, face a lot of downtimes for, let's say, maintenance. Uh, and at that situation, you might not have access to your coin when you need them the most. So like I said, guys, you know, not your keys, not your coins. Uh, the third one, obviously, is uh, the KYC ML part, where is know your customer and the money laundering laws. Uh, people do realize, I think, that uh, it is it is very dangerous in that, like, uh, because because uh, if you let's say if you're a U.S. citizen and you upload your social security number to any exchanges, uh, and they lose access to it one way or another in a in a black swan event or a hack, then you pretty much lose your identity and suspect and you you become susceptible to sort of like an identity theft. So, but what people don't realize it it is as that. It is not only dangerous but also very ineffective. You know that criminals can simply use the data that are leaked uh, or stolen or from the dark web or dark net, while honest users suffer increased risk of theft and extortion. And we have seen this happening last year with Binance as well, uh, where they lost huge amount of uh, customer data in an extortion event. So I, I think these three problems are something which uh, modern day quote unquote uh, custodial exchanges do face. So now the immediate question that comes after it is like, how are we solving these problems? What are we doing uh, to, to solve these problems that uh, we encounter? So now that comes back, circling back to our three core values of being privacy first, account free, and uh, self-custodial. Uh, so privacy first is uh, basically we don't, and if I may put it more accurately, we absolutely and categorically cannot track any data that could identify our users. Uh, it's just impossible uh, to do so from our side. And all public key users are completely uh, possible via Tor. If you go to Polestar Exchange slash FAQ, you will find uh, the Tor link for our front end. You'll find the Tor link uh, of LND addresses of both our nodes. Uh, Bitcoin and Litecoin, uh, so we simply don't have data to track our users. So even you know, in alternate universe, let's say we decide to become evil one day, uh, we won't have any uh, resource whatsoever to do any harm to any of the users. And we are also pretty account free, right? Like you can trade directly from your wallet and account registration, you know, identity, uh, emails, login, KYCs, user credentials, none of it. Uh, is important or none of it is essential at all uh, because our, you know these kind of account registration and identity verification is also pretty much the trademarks of these kind of exchanges right this not only shows the trading process uh, it sort of like slows down the trading process obviously but it also forces you to trust the exchange with uh, very sensitive personal information and the third one uh, of our core values is being self custodial in that like we are uh, so being account free, it sort of derives from that because being account free is only really possible and meaningful uh, with the property of atomicity. Uh, so all trades on bowls that happens are completely atomic, atomic you know, meaning that uh, the principle of atomicity sort of means that, that either the trade that you do on bowls happen in full, they either succeed or the funds don't move at all. Uh, so there is no uh, no case scenario, you know, before, during, or after the trading life cycle, where uh, you you will lose access to your keys. Uh, your keys will always stay with you during the whole process, and uh, it will be. Uh, and this atomicity principle, using atomic swaps, which Michael will talk about later, will in enables us to actually uh, do such things. So now should uh, we should talk about the product offerings, the kind of product we have built. Uh, on based on our core philosophies. So first one is uh, very apparent. We are an exchange service. So we do offer an exchange for our users. User can trade their Bitcoin and Litecoin and their Lightning counterparts uh, pairs on bulls.exchange. Uh, be sure to use HTTPS. Uh, there's the YouTube link I just saw. Uh, Jeff put in this uh, wasn't a secured one. So. Go to https slash slash exchange and trade your assets. It will work perfectly fine. 
And while the second one is not, which is not so intuitive, is we are also uh, a lightning service provider, right? Like LSP services uh, are basically used to on and off ramp from the lightning economy, right? Like uh, we allow a lot of wallet services and uh, a lot of different, a uh, lot of different scenarios to sort of uh, allow using LSPs like Bolts for businesses like Lightning Wallets, you know, they can use Bolts to uh, integrate all these services that we provide via RESTful API, right? So one of the advantages of using LSP like Bolts for businesses like Lightning Wallet is that we can abstract out the essential service necessary at the infrastructure level so that these businesses can better rally their resources to focus on features that would differentiate them uh, on a competitive market. Uh, now, uh, I thought like uh, we're working on a new UI for our front end that uh, we thought we should demo here. Uh, yeah, awesome. Show us. <laughs> all right. So we've been working on this for a while now, but uh, here it looks like uh, still a little bit of bells and whistles remaining, but uh, the gist of it is like main part is obviously this box, which you might be familiar with. So I'll go ahead and try and do a trade here, which would be a reverse submarine swap, actually. So I would, I would trade like 0 0.002 uh, Bitcoin, and I will receive 0 0.0019 Bitcoin uh, after uh, deduction of the total fee that includes minor fee and our own fees. So let's say we go to the next step now. Now it is asking us for a destination address, right? Like where do we want to receive our Bitcoin? Mind you, we are trading our Lightning Bitcoins for on-chain Bitcoins. So Bulls would need an address, on-chain address that we would need to give Bulls so that Bulls can send the fund to that destination. So let's just quickly create a A2 witness script address. So this is a testnet A2 witness script at Bitcoin address. And also, let me just show you the wallet balance right now. You can see that right now there is zero unconfirmed balance. Like there is no balance at all in this specific wallet. I will paste the Bitcoin address here. I will say swap instantly. Uh, this pretty much means that uh, the zero confirmation uh, would be allowed here. That means that that pretty much means that the the user will not wait for uh, one confirmation to release their uh, bitcoins or to pay the invoice in this case. So we go to the next step, and now we get a Bitcoin Lightning invoice. Right, uh, this Lightning invoice is Bulls giving us this Lightning invoice. As a user, I, I need to pay this invoice so that Bulls can send me the fund on the destination address that I provided in the last step. So I will just quickly pay this LNC LN invoice. We confirm it. And you can see that the swap has been successful, where we have swapped 0 0.002 BTC for 0 0.009960 uh, on-chain BTC. So we can even verify that right now if I clear out my template. Did I do any? It's wallet balance. Wallet oh, balance. No, no. Uh, you can see that now I have some unconfirmed balance here. Uh, yeah. So, so it, it was pretty seamless and uh, easy, especially the reverse swap part. Uh, now switching black to the slides. Uh, hey, okay. Can I uh, ask we, one question? Sure. sure. Um, uh, there, there was a difference in the amount. Um, um, that is that like for the on-chain fees? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we have for all our swaps we have an on-chain fee because we send on-chain transactions, and also we take a tiny little cut on the amount that is swapped for providing the service. Yeah, cool. So the nineteen, uh, the hundred ninety-nine thousand six hundred sixty satoshi are the fee before uh, chain on-chain uh, transaction fees, right? So this is um, just deducted the 
the bolts fee and then what comes what, what shows up in the wallet address is the the net um, transaction yeah exactly yep that's correct awesome uh, so so we talked about the exchange service you saw our demo of reverse submarine swap but uh, we also built another different product that is uh, like we also act as a lightning service provider so Pulse provide provides like of um, different lightning services like normal reverse normal submarine swap that is from on chain bitcoin to lightning bitcoins let's say for example and reverse submarine swaps as well that is from lightning bitcoin to on chain bitcoin and we expose it via restful api so all the wallets all the different wallets uh, like breeze in this case can use uh, Breeze and XUD, obviously, Exchange Union's XUD, they can use this uh, service to sort of seamlessly onboard users into their platform and can focus more on their cool product offerings. And as I talked about before as well, like Breeze also uses Pulse as an LSP. Uh, so all the when you do a withdrawal from the Breeze wallet, it is completely powered by Pulse, and it is a reverse submarine swap that I just demoed to you. So Breeze has also integrated our REST API to enable that. Uh, and we are also working on integration with a very popular node management tool that Michael will talk about later. But the gist of it is again is that if you are a Lightning uh, Power user, if you're someone who runs a Lightning node, uh, then you can sort of use our services very, very seamlessly and a pretty easy way. Uh, so the next uh, topic is Pulse architecture and uh, the real highlight of the soul, the atomic swaps. And I will let Michael, take up from here, and he will All right. talk about it. Let me just stop sharing my screen. All right. I will talk a little bit about the architecture of Bolts and how we make this trustless and non-custodial trades happen with atomic swaps. So first of all, what is an atomic swap? These atomic swaps allow you to exchange different kinds of cryptocurrencies in a trustless and non-custodial way. This works even if the cryptocurrencies are on different blockchains or as Anchor just demoed on, Bit on the Bitcoin on-chain and on Lightning. The first prominent, success, uh, prominent successful sub atomic swap has been done from the Litecoin to the Bitcoin chain by Charlie Lee in 2017. In Bolts, we use a different kind of atomic swap that we call submarine swap. And these submarine swaps allow you to exchange coins from the chain to Lightning or the other way around, from Lightning to the chain. These submarine, these submarine swaps are a kind of sub atomic swap and allow you to do these trades on Bolts in an atomic and non-custodial way. We have two kinds of submarine swaps in Bolts. The first one is called the normal submarine swap. This is when the user trades from on-chain coins to Lightning ones. For example, on-chain BTC to Lightning BTC. When such a trade happens, it starts by the user pasting a Lightning invoice that should be paid. Based on that Lightning invoice, Bolts generates a pay to witness script hash address and gets the pre-image hash from the invoice and encodes it in the redeem script from which the pay to witness script hash address is derived. On the right hand side, you can see such a redeem script and that is enforcing the properties of the submarine swap. Here it just says that if you have the private key of bolts and the pre-image, you can spend the coins. Or if a time lock has expired and you have the private key of the user, you can also spend the coins. The next step of a submarine, normal submarine swap is that the user sends funds to the generated address. And once the bolts backend sees that the transaction the user sent is confirmed on the blockchain, we pay the lightning invoice that the user provided and can claim the on-chain coins, which means that the submarine swap has succeeded. Um, in case the submarine swap fails for some reason, in case we can't pay the invoice, the user can use its private key that was generated in the browser in case of our front end and refund its coins back to the wallet. 
The other kind of submarine swap we have in bowls are the reverse submarine swaps that Anchor just demoed, and those are from Lightning to on-chain. For example, Lightning Bitcoin to on-chain Bitcoin. In a reverse submarine swap, the backend, the bolts backend, and the user switch roles, which means that the user receives on-chain and sends on-chain and sends off-chain coins on Lightning. We had to change the protocol a little bit to fix some uh, spam attack vectors and make this whole process more seamless. And this the reverse submarine swap start by the user generating a random pre-image. This random pre-image is just 32 random bytes of data. In case of the demo anchor chat showed, it is generated in the browser automatically for the user. The bolt backend receives the, pre the hash of the pre-image and generates a hold invoice based on that hash. The difference between hold invoice and a normal invoice is just that in case of a hold invoice, the lightning node that generates the invoice does not know the pre-image. So when the user pays the invoice that the Bolt backend generated, Bolt starts locking up on-chain coins. That can be claimed once the user reveals the pre-image by spending that UTXO that we locked up. Until then, we are not able to actually receive the Lightning coins that the user sent because the HDLC is just sitting there pending on our Lightning node. But once the user claims the on-chain coins we sent, the pre-image is revealed on-chain in a claim transaction. We scan the chain continuously and the mempool to figure out when the claim transaction is sent. And once we see the claim transaction, we actually are able to settle the invoice and the swap is done. In case the user doesn't claim the on-chain coins for some reason, we automatically cancel the pending HDLC, which means that the Lightning coins go back to the user. And we also refund our on-chain coins that we locked up. Uh, as Anchor said, Breeze is using these reverse submarine swaps to power their on-chain withdrawals in their wallet. And we were also the first one to deploy these reverse submarine swaps to the Bitcoin mainnet. But we have one more kind of swap we want to show. And this is something we call channel creation swaps. These channel creation swaps are a new kind of swap that we want to present you. And we think they are pretty cool and will allow for a more smooth experience in the Lightning Network. The flow of such a channel creation swap will look like this. The user just sends Bitcoin, on-chain Bitcoin, to some wallet that is using bolts. And the end goal for this channel creation swaps is that the user gets a balanced channel between his node and the bolts node. From on-chain coins to a ba balanced channel in one flow without ever losing the custody over the funds. This is a service similar to what Bitrefill is offering with the four Lightning service, but the important difference is that this is completely self-custodial and trust minimized. The user never, never loses the custody over the funds in the complete process. And in one way or another, these normal submarine swaps are similar to channel creation swaps. The main difference is just that in the process of the channel creation swap, a channel gets created and the invoice that the user provides is paid via a new channel. We think that these channel creation swaps will help a lot when it comes to onboarding new users to the Lightning Network or bootstrapping new routing nodes, simply because getting inbound liquidity is hard on the Lightning Network. When you open a channel, you have outbound liquidity. You can pay, but you can't be paid. That's a real problem, we think. And therefore, we created the channel creation swaps just because when you do a channel creation swap, in instead of just opening a channel, you get both inbound and outbound liquidity without ever sacrificing your the custody over, the, over your funds during the process. We are also the first ones to deploy these channel creation swaps on mainnet. They are not on mainnet publicly available, but I did a channel creation swap on mainnet earlier today 
and I want you to show a quick screencast of the process. Yeah, this is very cool, guys. Uh, so yeah, it looks it sounds pretty exciting. Um, I was just aware of the bit refill thing, and um, it's good to see like some some alternatives popping up to that. Not yep. because bit refill is bad, but to, to just see have more options, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, on the right terminal, there is a C Lightning node with a plugin for the channel creation swaps that I created during the last Lightning Hex sprint. And on the left side, I'm interacting with the Lightning daemon and with the Bitcoin Core daemon. What I did is execute a command that the plugin adds, which is called add channel creation. That command simply sends a REST request to our API and also saves the proper safety values that are needed to enforce the channel creation swap. Here I'm doing a channel creation swap for 1 million Satoshis and I want 25% in my liquidity. I get back an address by Bolts and the amount it expects to see. I just send the on-chain coins and once the transaction was sent, all I had to do is just wait for confirmations. The lockup transaction I sent with Bitcoin CLI needed one confirmation and afterwards the channel that was created needed three confirmations to become active. Let's just skip a little. So after, after the confirmations, the plugin, the plugin channel creation printed accepted channel creation, which, which means that it verified that the amount, the capacity of the channel was enough to pay the invoice and also enough for the 25 extra inbound liquidity. Once the channel state changed from awaiting lock-in, which means that it waited for three confirmations to channel normal, channel normal means that the channel can be used. The plugin printed accepted invoice payment, which means that the invoice was paid via that newly freshly created channel. The plugin also exposes the get channel creation command, which prints out all the values the lightning daemon has about the swap, which is the redeem script, the private key for refund transaction, the pre-image hash, the invoice and whatnot. And when I check list peers to actually list the channel that was created, we can see the 1 million Satoshis that were, pay, that were paid with the invoice and that the channel capacity is 1.3, roughly 1.3 million Satoshis, which means that I also got the 25% inbound liquidity I wanted. Awesome. Um, so wh where is that extra liquidity coming from? You're kind of sponsoring that. Yeah, we are kind of sponsoring that. We are thinking about ways to monetize this, but the current approach is just sponsoring that and yeah, earning routing fees by creating channels. That, it's pretty cool. I mean, this, uh, this saves <coughs> um, rebalancing, for example, so um, mm -hmm. you don't even have to do a loop. Yeah. So for the for the non technical user, uh, which I'm outing myself as, is that means I'm I'm opening a channel, which then gets a sponsored bi bidirectional basically balance uh, from you, so that I can both send and receive, but I don't have to do the extra steps. Um, not quite. You don't open a channel. Bolts opens a channel to you. Okay, and, yeah, so the yeah, technical exactly. detail, that's semantics to me, but important for the process. But okay. you send on-chain coins and get a balance channel back. Okay. Yeah. And in completely non-custodial, uh, self-custodial manner, right? This Unlike not, the, yeah. the... So that this means is, that if this okay. channel is closed, then I get back my million Satoshi and you get back your sponsored amount and then we're square. Yeah. When the channel so, is closed, it's, it, it behaves just like a normal channel. So like this would be a, a really great way for companies that don't yet offer a lightning uh, services and don't want to um, kind of deal with the hassle of running a node and providing the service to customers to just basically include the service into their offerings and say, okay, uh, press this button, uh, put half a Bitcoin or a million Satoshi or whatever into it, and then they the customer or the user could just operate on the Lightning network in both directions, sending and receiving um, seamlessly without you know the company getting into the Lightning details. Yeah, for example. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, and also we've been working on these channel creation swaps with Breeze, mm -hmm. 
the Breeze mobile Lightning wallet. And the great thing for Breeze is that they don't have an on-chain wallet. And figuring out a way to deposit coins into a wallet that doesn't have on-chain uh, on balance is pretty hard. But with this, channel, with this channel creation swaps, you can go from on-chain to a balanced channel without ever having to deal with on-chain transactions. But if I had if I had an uh, if I had a wallet that was on chain and I wanted to offer full lightning um, usability, then this would be the the, the se most seamless and easiest way to kind of go about it. It seems. Yeah, exactly. It saves you the step of rebalancing the channel, and yeah, it it just gets you where you want in the direct and most seamless way. So how many how many nodes? So what's the if if you open a node to the customer or to the person or to the wallet? Um, how many? What's what would be the maximum uh, throughput? What's how are you connected on your end? Um, so we have we have a pretty big node on the Lightning Network that is pretty good, pretty well connected. And we are once we see that some swap is failing because we can't pay an invoice or. We can't be paid. We are also trying to actively actively improve our routing by opening new channels. That's great. Yep, and we are also going to automate the rebalancing part of the channels as well. So uh, everything just works uh, seamlessly all the time. Uh, I, they have, do have a user um, a question, which uh, I think is a good time to ask this now. Um, it's from Super Testnet. And he writes, it seems like the security of those swaps relies upon the user's ability to withdraw from the swap address. Is that swap address and the script necessary to move the fonts that go into it displayed to the user visually? If it's all handled invisibility, invisibly via JavaScript, what happens if the user closes the browser before the JavaScript can execute? Yes, the problem with not your keys, not your Bitcoin is that if you lose the keys, it's not your Bitcoin. Um, in the browser, in our front-end implementation, we store the required values for refunding and claiming coins in the local storage. At least that's the way we do it in our new front-end. In our old front-end, this problem exists. But like in a, in a normal submarine swap, you get a refund file in case that you can download, in case something goes wrong. And for the reverse submarine swaps, when you don't claim the coins, the Lightning funds get back to your wallet automatically because we cancel the pending HDLC. So there's pretty much no way a user could lose funds. Okay, thank you. All right. So we've also been working on integrating our services into node management tools specifically RTL, Write the Lightning, which is a graphical user interface for managing your LND or C Lightning node. Right now, it just supports Lightning Loop, but I think there should, we think that should, there should be an alternative to Loop, and therefore, we are working real hard on making a PR for RTL happen to integrate the both services alongside the Loop ones and also feature the channel creation swaps. Here we have a little sneak, sneak peek of what I did in this TLI could look like in a graphical user interface. You can just enter values there and it's for most people it's pretty much it's easier to use the graphical user interface than to mess with the command line interface. Well, when All is right. that when is that coming out? Um that's a good question actually. <laughs> uh, we have the normal and reverse submarine swaps working in RTL in a branch of ours <clears> and <throat> are working on the channel creation swaps. We have no expected time of arrival, but we are working real hard on it. Yep. Uh, basically, as far as RTL is concerned, uh, we, have, we have walked their front end and we have uh, started implementing uh, and actually have tested both the normal and reverse submarine swap. And now there is like, as Michael has uh, demonstrated the channel opening swaps as well, we will uh, now the further roadmap for us is to integrate that into the GUI of uh, Ride the Lightning, and then we'll be good for the PR. Yes, and we, and we aim for 
merging that PR into master so that everyone using RTL has also access to builds. Exactly. That's about it from our side. Feel free to ask questions and we'll be happy to answer them. I think you're muted, Jeff. Yeah, you're muted, Jeff. Oops, <laughs> sorry. Thank you um, for the presentation and also for the RTL thing because I'm actually a user of RTL and um, I think that that's a great feature to have um, in in the app. Um, there. So if you um, have any questions, now is a good time to ask them. And Super Testnet is apparently looking into your API right now. And he's asking some questions on MetaMost. Um, one of them was, before he found it, actually, if you have an API, API and where to find it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. following that question, um, I don't see anything about channel openings in the API or in the current front end. Is that feature coming soon? Yes. Um, we have an API available on docs.bolts.exchange. But this API does not include the channel creation swaps yet. In the demo video I just showed, I had a little bit, a little, a few issues that I had to iron out on the fly. And we want to provide a good user experience and want to fix these errors before we deploy them on mainnet publicly. But they will, will, will be coming out really, really soon. Okay, that's good, good to hear. There's another question from RH on YouTube. He says, noob question, will it be possible to run this RTL on Raspberry Blitz or my node BTC setup? Um, I don't know whether any of these two setups include RTL, but sure, why not? Like yep. RTL is just a front end for a lightning node. And once you have a lightning node setting up, RTL is no problem. Yeah, it will work on any device that RTL currently works on uh, so it should definitely work so um rtl is i'm just going to explain that i'm not sure if everyone is familiar it's right the lightning and it's pretty much an interface a uh, graphical interface for your lightning node um which works to my no no knowledge on l and d and c lightning yes yep. um and RTL does work on the Raspberry Blitz. It, it is one of the standard um, services that you can install on the Raspberry Blitz. So um, as soon as um, it is merged, I assume it is also usable on the Raspberry Blitz. So the answer to the question is, to my knowledge, yes, definitely. And that's also why I'm excited, because that's also one of the nodes I'm choosing. Yep. We can rope you in for better testing as well, then. Yeah, awesome. We'd we'll love that. Uh, just <laughs> ping me and we'll, we'll, we'll make it happen. <laughs> yeah. All right. If I, if I can just ask, ask like two or three questions about the trading aspect. So um, just a, a, a quick back of the napkin uh, calculation says your fees are about 2.2%. That's pretty much standard or are you, just de are you deviating, deviating from that in regards to what the amount is or what the currency is? So... Uh, OK, I'll let you answer that. OK, so uh, the fee part contains two different parts, right? There is a minor fee, uh, which is very high right now, because, uh, because Yeah, I'm just talking about your own fees. The mining fee is, is of course, um, variable. But is your fee fixed? Yeah, our fee is fixed. It is a certain percentage of uh, the amount that user wants to send. It's from 0 to 25% to 0.5%. And uh, it's definitely not 2.2%. <laughs> No, 0 0.2, that was what I got run about for the uh, transaction yeah. that we just did, right? Okay. Um, and then, so just, I, I mentally skipped over all the pre-image hash PS2 HK parts in your presentation because I believe you understand all of that. So could I imagine that as sort of like an escrow service as well? So basically you're taking the, you're locking up your own um, uh, on-chain coins, wait until I pay the lightning uh, invoice once that has been done, you release and pay out. Uh, and how how do you organize liquidity? I would imagine, since you don't have an order book and you don't have customers depositing and trading back and forth all the time, it would become difficult in the future if you were uh, supporting, let's say, 27 different chains and currencies to keep liquidity in all of them. And uh, third question would be, where do you 
replenish that. Um, so basically, you have your own uh, books and liquidity that you manage to fulfill uh, customers' uh, invoices. First of all, I want to answer the pre-match question. Yes, it is kind of an escrow. It is chaining two hash time lock contracts together. And once one contract is fulfilled, the other one can be too. Anchor, you want to answer the trading part? Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I didn't get it. Can you repeat the question, Jeff? What was the question? Yeah. So, so um, of course, if I send lightning, uh, lightning transaction to you, you have to pay out on chain and vice versa. And mm -hmm. given that you might plan to add more currencies, maybe okay. even tokens and different um, protocols, you would have to have a certain stash or like a certain amount of liquidity for each of those currencies or protocols you offer at hand to fulfill the hopefully increasing customer flow. So um, what is, doesn't that like pose a challenge uh, to you, um, hoping that your, that your service rises in popularity and having to always um, have all of those at hand to be ready for users to utilize that function? Uh, yeah, OK, so uh, this is actually a great question. The uh, liquidity thing is obviously a bottleneck for, for us right now. But uh, we have plans in place uh, using which we can sort of uh, do so in a uh, non-custodial manner. But right now, what we do is we manually hedge trade uh, and manually refill and manually balance the channel and make sure that it's always filled on right now. And even with stuff like Mumbo in Lightning Channel, once that is that is enabled, uh, the limit will increase for the Lightning Channels. And especially in 0 0.10 LND, we have Mumbo. So that will make it a little more easier. But in future, obviously, we have plans to, uh, to do so in a completely decentralized manner. Uh, using hedge trades and, and stuff. Right. Basically and, pulling the liquidity from centralized exchanges. OK, that would be the, the follow up question. So given that you're very privacy conscious, mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't imagine this is all this all runs on your laptop uh, at your very comfortable homes, wherever they may be. But this mm -hmm. is probably uh, hosted somewhere. So uh, are you taking any provisions? So uh, interested agencies may, may not be able to triangulate the services that you employ, let's say you hosted all this on, on Amazon, uh, um, then that, of course, would be an attack vector. So what are you doing to keep your operations off grid? Great question. Yeah, uh, Dennis, you're on fire. <laughs> OK, so uh, th this is something that we thought about from the very beginning, you know, since uh, being completely self-custodial, uh, Bolts is running on a centralized server. So in short, we are running Bulls uh, as a project, right? Not as a company. We are avoiding a legal entity. Also, we made sure that Bulls can quickly be moved to a new location should one day our hosting provider decides to turn against us. Uh, we have learned lot, a lot from the Pirate Way and the Binance here. And ultimately, all of the Bulls code is open source. And at some point, we will make it easier for other projects to run their own Bulls instance too. So we want to see more lightning services providers out there, right? Like Loop and Bolt shouldn't only be the only ones, only choice that users have. The more, the merrier. So uh, so in short, we are, uh, as you see, we are completely anonymous here. Uh, we don't have a legal entity. And we plan to continue to circumvent uh, like that. But I mean, this is, I, I, like, I like the sentiment. Mm -hmm. um, but coming from a world uh, where, uh, like, that is, has one leg in banking and the other in crypto, it's kind of hard do, doing this without splitting your genes uh, to, to, to paint a colorful picture. Uh, that does make it difficult probably to solicit corporations with existing companies or entities that are legally obliged to kind of uh, divulge their outsourcing or their partnerships. So is there a pla are there plans to kind of go to split this off and maybe do like a for-profit and, and, uh, and the non-profit um, arm of this? Uh, uh, look, it's uh, it's crypto to crypto only, right? Like our trade is crypto to crypto only. There is no fiat part in there. So, uh, so having a, a, I don't know how much having a legal entities would actually help, but uh, but that that is something which is uh, way down our roadmap. And we honestly we haven't given it a lot of thought, but uh, we think that as you say, uh, that might be an option in the future for us, definitely. Um, Great, thanks, Simon. 
crypto to crypto is a good um, segue into the next question. Uh, Michael is asking on YouTube, the atomic swaps only work for UTXO, uh, UTXO coins like Bitcoin, right? Not nimble, nimble, co nimble, nimble coins, uh, for example, Grin or Beam. Um, it works for every chain that supports, supports HDLCs, which means if you have a ha hashing function, or uh, time lock and time locks it works on that chain for example we already have contracts ready for ethereum so we could potentially do swaps with es20 and ether and it also works for mimble wimble chains and theoretically for monero if you use special kinds of signatures that allow you to do hdlcs so you said you have it ready um What? We have contracts ready, not okay. ready for deployment. Okay, so what you got any plans there? Was it just to try it out, or I, I'm assuming you you want to launch that at some point? It was both, honestly. I wanted to try a little bit with. I wanted to try myself a little bit with Solidity, and down the road we really want to integrate Ether 20 tokens like stable coins, USDC, and Dai, to have a BTC USDC pair. Which would like greatly improve your your, your offering, right? I mean, the... yeah, exactly. It will actually hedge user against the volatility of the market. I'm sorry, come again. It will hedge the users against the Bitcoin volatility that exists. You know, so it's definitely a very popular pair. You can then also use Wrap Bitcoin, which I hear is uh, is the next big thing. Next big thing right now, just to piss off Jeff. He's <laughs> <laughs> being silly again. Um, yeah. Michael is. Um, <laughs> Michael is. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a comment or a question. Um, there's no time locks on Mimblewimble coins. Question mark. Uh, yes, we have never actually looked into Mimblewimble like Grin and Beam, but at some point in time, I saw a swap done between Bitcoin and Mimblewimble. I don't recall the details, but I think it's possible to do. Okay, and uh, right now you're um, just supporting Bitcoin on and off-chain and Lightning, Litecoin um, on and off-chain, right? Yes, because we wanted to integrate Bitcoin first. And since Bitcoin and Litecoin are pretty much the same thing from a technical point of view, we also included Litecoin. Yep, and our focus actually recently shifted to the LSP side of things. Uh, right. So uh, we're pretty much lagging on that, but we'll definitely in include more very, very soon. I mean, um, the the LSP side looks more blue ocean to me, like there's more opportunities and, and lots of development that um, is maybe theoretically available, but has still be put into code. So uh, I think it's it's like probably the, even a better way to go forward, honestly. Yeah. Yep. Like uh, just amazing how fast <laughs> everything is moving in this community. So yeah, it's definitely a, a whole lot of opportunity out there. And uh, all we can do is try our best to capitalize on that. Yeah. <laughs> Super Tester <laughs> just said um, plus infinity for stablecoin integration. So I guess uh, he's not a test of uh, a fan of stablecoin integration. Um, uh, he's yeah. also asking Or, or commenting, I was quite surprised to see you typing C Lightning commands into your terminal, um, Michael. I assumed yep. you were using yeah. LD because you support Litecoin's Lightning network. Did I don't create. Sorry, okay. uh, I don't think C Lightning supports that. What's the story there? It does not support Litecoin terminal knowledge, but the channel creation swap I did was on the Bitcoin network, on chain, and on Lightning. And we are, we really, really want to support all the lighting implementations out there. So I use the lightning for the demo, but it also works with LND and Declare. Okay, thanks. I hope that answers the question for Super Testnet for now. Um, if there are any other questions, uh, now is a good time to write them. And while we're on it, uh, there's also a good chance to give you a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Um, I'm not sure, do, Dennis. Do you have any, any other questions? Um, I, I have I have one or two which I which I uh, might be asking in private. Um, one more is uh, the, um, the uh, regarding the channel um, channel as a service, if if you will. 
which I think is a, a fucking bomb feature. Um, so would this also include tools that let me um, handle this channel, like send and receive? So basically, is there a whole uh, front end um, uh, section of the of this API that lets me actually uh, send and receive and pay invoices and yada yada? Or you, do you rely on the uh, the wallet providers uh, the capabilities in ha actually actually um, facility uh, managing the channel. We are just providing the channel service uh, with RTL. We are we want to have a nice graphical user interface for all the features a Lightning Node offers. But Bolt itself does just the channel creation and the enforcement of all the properties of the swap and. Everything else is pretty much up to the user, which front end. So they would have to, to basically bring their own lightning infrastructure to the table user side. Um, you just create the channel in both directions. Yeah, we just create the channel and everything else is up to the user. All right, understood. Still good. <laughs> yeah, still good. <laughs> um, no, I think if you see, if you see with the Breeze wallet, like, uh, if you talk about like completely end user experience, like someone who is using Breeze Wallet, the user of the Breeze Wallet wouldn't have to bring their own Lightning box or anything like that, right? Like they, the Breeze integrates us, and then the user integrates Breeze. So there is the one more middleman in there in between, uh, right. which which take care of that. So if you're if you are talking about complete end and normal users, I think it also makes for a pretty good user experience. Yeah, it's just that the question was just if I were a wallet provider and I have a an on-chain wallet, then mm -hmm. uh, if you brought a whole tool set for me to just basically pretend being a Lightning wallet by creating a channel, having the user um, send and receive Lightning pay invoices through a set of APIs, or if this, like once the channel is open, the wallet provider would have to integrate um, all the means of um, handling Lightning network transactions by themselves. To open a channel, you need two Lightning nodes. One Lightning node has to be from the user run by the user All but right. we op we kind of also support the use case you're talking about with the normal and reverse submarine swaps those allow you to send to pay lightning invoices with on-chain coins which is kind of the use case you described okay makes sense okay i think there's uh one more maybe last question before we open up the jitsi talk to the general public i posted um in a bit in the comments and on twitter the last question is about um integration well you've been for uh, the bitcoin and litecoin only for over a year now are there any plans to integrate side chains like liquid or rootstock um i i think we have uh, we have internally discussed a lot about uh, what kind of chains we want to integrate and what kind of trade-offs we want to make, you know, especially uh, no one would know better than you, Jeff, that our <laughs> followers and people who use our, our bottom line, if not total Bitcoin maximalists. So we have to be extremely careful on what kind of trading peers we support. But, uh, but right now, I, as far as our business model is concerned, we think that a stable Bitcoin peer would do more good uh, than any side chains like Liquid for now. But it's definitely something uh, that we can talk more about. Uh, and obviously the user feedback is more important. The more, whatever they want, we are going to build it for them. As long as you don't um, support Ripple, I think we're all fine. Um, <laughs> but but, don't, but don't, don't get pressured by Bitcoin maximalists, right, Jeff? Uh, well, I think you're talking to three of them, maybe <laughs> three and a half, and if you include yourself. <laughs> I know, I know still. Yeah, um, Liquid is pretty cool. I think down the road, it would be definitely great, especially with channel creation swaps. When you send liquid BTC and get the lightning channel on the main chain, that would definitely be cool to use. Okay, cool. Um, I think people are getting ready to jump on the Jitsi to continue the conversation a bit. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. By the way, um, before before um, recording this or before going on the live stream, I tried out Baldix, Bolt's Exchange and it's actually a pretty smooth experience it worked like flawlessly and super quick i was like whoa um just give it a try if you have a chance i did i did too i can i ask you one more question 
Yeah. So um, I, I exchanged uh, 50,000 50, uh, Satoshi for on-chain, um, which worked pretty well after after I went through it. It just made me select uh, accept zero confirmation. And this is the part of the escrow aspect, right? So basically, if I were to receive on-chain, um, I am, you are waiting for the on-chain transaction to confirm before you accept the Lightning invoice, or what is the deal there? Um, you're talking about reverse swaps. The first step of a reverse swap is the user paying the invoice. And then we, we lock up on-chain coins, and it's up to the user to accept zero conf or wait for one confirmation. That doesn't matter for the escrow. It's just about how impa impatient you are. Once you either have a confirmation or accept, accept zero conf, you click on the next button or it goes to the next step and does the claim transaction that sends the actual coins to your dest destined address. And that claim transaction releases the pre-image, which in turn allows us to settle the Lightning invoice. Uh, just as just to add to that, I think the zero confirmation that you talk about is is completely at the discretion of the user, right? You are in command of if you want to accept it or not. You can just uh, choose to not accept it and wait for uh, a block to be mined to to get your bitcoins. But uh, at the same time, the the because Bitcoin chains does not does not have uh, uh, RBF on by default. It is a uh, low risk compared to uh, several other chains. So that means if I w was if I wouldn't accept zero conf, it would it would take one block and then the transaction on chain would be sent to my yeah, to that my would be the, no, that no, would be the it's not waiting for a block to be sent. We send the transaction and we ask you whether you want to wait until that transaction we sent is confirmed. Yep. Uh, that would be the purest way to trade. Yeah, and, and it did really work uh, fantastically, and it popped up in my wallet seconds later. So, um, really exceptional work, really smooth experience, great user interface, um, yeah. work worked nicely. Thank Thanks you. A Means a lot coming from you. What, what, when are you um, planning to release the new the new um, user interface? Uh, we are currently in the works. We are currently working on the mobile part of it. We also want the mobile experience to be uh, a lot better. So I think end of this month or uh, first week of next month, uh, we should be there on the mainnet all across all mobile, optimized, everything well, and ready to glow. Awesome. Great. Uh, good luck. Um, I guess you already got two more new users, uh, <laughs> which are already, <laughs> <laughs> we're already excited. Um, Definitely. Thank you for coming on. Um, it's been a pleasure. It's super interesting and looking forward to, to all the features that are being built um, on making Lightning more usable in, in that case and more user friendly. Um, thank you, Anchor and Michael, and also thank you, Dennis, for co hosting. Um, just a quick preview next week, we're going to talk about watchtowers. Uh, Sergi Degado is going to come on, um, he is working on Eye of Satoshi. And co-host will be Max Hillebrand. So another exciting episode. Um, thank you for tuning in. Join the Jitsi Talk uh, in a couple seconds. And see you next week. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks, thanks for having Bye. us. Bye. Cheers. Bye.